Thank you. Thank you very much. I really appreciate you coming out today. I want to start out by saying how uh, just honored and privileged I feel to be here and how grateful I am to the Crystal Bridges uh, Museum of Art for including my work in the exhibition and for having me out this weekend. I was able to teach a photography workshop and it was just a great joy of mine to be here. And uh, I'm here today to reflect a little bit on uh, how this uh, body of work came about. And I wonder if anybody here is uh, familiar with the work that was made uh, during the Great Depression, uh, the photographs that were made by Dorothea Lange. Is anybody familiar with the migrant mother photograph? So I, I just a little background. Before I ever took one photograph in this series, I took inspiration from the work that was made during the Great Depression. Dorothea Lange, Walker Evans, artists uh, that came to mind. And the, the reason why I took inspiration from that was because, let's just take the migrant mother, for example. That image has become an iconic image, an image that we use to this day to reflect, to remember, and, and hopefully to heal. And so when the Great Depression happened, which was before my time, I'm sort of connected to that as an American through this iconic photograph of this mother moving her children across the country. And so when the economic collapse of our time, the largest one, happened, I decided I want to do a project that sort of reflects on this at the time. And at the time, it wasn't a great recession. It was just it was a housing crisis. Um, it and that's how it started. And I, and I did some research, and I found out that one of the cities that's close to where I live, I live in the San Francisco Bay Area, Stockton, California, um, was dubbed the epicenter of the foreclosure crisis early on in 2008 by the uh, news show 60 Minutes. And so because of the proximity to where I live and because of the desire to create a body of work um, that reflected on the economic crisis that we were going through, I started traveling to Stockton in uh, January of 2009. And uh, when I first went to Stockton, I didn't uh, know much about the city and I didn't have a lot of connections there. And so the very first photograph that I made, you happen to have in your exhibit right here, and it's, it's this image right here. And when you look at this image, I hope you notice uh, two things. On one level, it's just a photograph of a building in downtown Stockton. But what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to use the power of still photography, and in this case, through place and object, to weave together a narrative of what our country went through. And so I hope that you notice that you can still see the name of the bank there, but there's something about it. What, what is going on? What's, what do you notice about the name of the bank? That's right. It's just the shadow of the name. Also, it gives you a sense of place. We know we're in the Pacific state. We know we're on the West Coast. So, but exactly, it's just a shadow of a name because it's been removed and it's gone. And this bank is one of the largest banks in downtown Stockton, and now they're gone. But what else do we notice about this photograph? It's really just a photograph of a building. Anything? Anybody? The windows are dark. That's true. And there's no people there. Do you notice anything else? Anybody? Exactly. The clouds on the horizon. This storm. And this is just, I was lucky, I was blessed that day. I went the first time there. I'm looking around. I'm looking for a way to connect with the city and to start to illustrate what's happening. So I was able to go up in a parking garage and get this angle um, where I can illustrate this building and how the, the bank was there and now it's gone and these sort of looming clouds on the horizon. And so it's a way of taking just a still photograph, a simple photograph that's just on one level, just a photograph of a building, but start to put together a narrative about this economic crisis that this town and indeed our country was going through at the time. Well then how do you get um, access to all these other things? You go there each week, you build relationships, you meet people, you go to open houses of foreclosed homes, you bump into a real estate agent. The real estate agent notices that you're not just taking snapshots, what are you doing? Have an intuition, I really need to tell this guy everything of what I'm trying and hoping to do. He becomes a confidant, indeed he becomes a friend, to where he starts to um, let me know, oh you should go to this house. And then over the course of, of weeks, um, he gives, he 
um, begins to trust me and knows that he can, that I'm doing something honorable and that I'm trying to serve as witness to his city and its struggle. And so he'll, um, first he has to go with me to each home and he's waiting there while I make the photographs. And then he'll take me to the home a couple of weeks later and he'll let me in. And then as weeks go on, oh yeah, here's the address, here's the code to the lockbox. Because you build relationships and you build trust. And that's the way you start to form. Just each week you go to the community, you immerse yourself in it, you build trust and you build relationships. So indeed, when I work on a project like this, it's long term and I'm building relationships. And in a way, I'm becoming part of the community. I'm immersing myself in it. So we're just going to step through here. So any home that you see, is a home that's foreclosed. It's been taken from the family who owns it and, and the bank now owns it. Any damage that you see, like in this case, um, there was anger and frustration and in some cases there were break-ins and in some cases people would gain access uh, and then uh, take things from the home for different motivations. And so this is a way of illustrating through the damage, the frustration that's going on in the city. Let's come over here to this home right here. So this is a bedroom and a home that's been foreclosed on. And I'm purposefully, in this particular body of work, not looking to have the person who lives in this room or who lived in this room before in it, because I don't want it specifically to be about that person. And I also want our imagination to sort of start to flow. So when we see this image, and just with the knowledge that it's a foreclosed home, and it has these walls that are painted in a very distinctive way, for me, my imagination starts to go to, well, I wonder who lived there before. And I wonder how the walls ended up painted that way. And I start to connect with the photograph in my own mind, and so I start to connect with the process of economic collapse that's going on in this town and indeed across our country. I imagine is probably a child's room. I imagine that the parents probably said, you know, you can paint your room any color you want. It's your room. And the kid probably came back, I'm imagining, with these three wild colors, and who knows what the parents thought, but they're, okay, this is going on in my mind. And, but what I definitely see is pride of ownership and someone making their space their own. And then you lay on top of that the knowledge that this home is foreclosed on, that this person, if it was a child, is removed from this r room in this house. There's one other thing here. What are these tracks here? The one thing that the bank would always do is clean the carpet. I, I, I don't know why that was, but that's they'd always clean the carpet. They didn't necessarily take care of the grounds. Let's look up here. What's this? It looks kind of beautiful. It's got all these flowers growing in the backyard. So to take a photograph that has some beauty in it, gets you to stop and want to take a look at it, but then lay on top of that. Oh, it's a home that's been foreclosed on. Oh, those are beautiful flowers, but why are they so tall and why are they filling the yard? What kind of flower is that? It's a weed. It's ragweed. It's beautiful, but it's also a indicative of the bank owning the home and not necessarily caring for every aspect of it. Maybe they would clean the carpet to try to sell it quickly, but maybe they let the backyard go. So there's this narrative that starts to build up, and it builds up in our imagination. It takes us to that place, I hope, and helps us reflect on this economic shift. And, um, and then let's move across here. So here's a photograph. It's sort of straightforward in one way. It says end, it's kind of dramatic, um, but we can read this photograph. What do I mean by read the photograph? Well, why would you make a street that just ends like that right there? And then, wait a minute, the sidewalks just end too. If you're a developer, why would you develop a street like that? Why would you end a road just like that? Anybody have an idea? What, what is on the other side? There's a photograph in the series that's not on this wall that shows what's on the other side, and your museum owns that. If you stuck your camera through that, which I did, and you can look on my website and look for it, um, there's a 
farm back there, and all the crops are growing. And then if you look beyond that, what's beyond that? Almost like a train of tract houses at the other side. So what, what's, what's going on with this farm? Well, this is the farmer who didn't want to sell his land, the one farmer who retained his land. You start to read it. Oh, so this is, this is a development that's out on the outskirts of town. It's sprawling. It's going to the edges. They're buying it. What's the developer thinking in this photograph? They're thinking, I'm going to buy that land eventually. They're going to sell it to me. Someday they're going to sell out. And we're just going to continue this street. Everything's set up for that. You can see that. Yeah, exactly. He's going to give in. This farmer on the other side is going to give in, and we're going to be able to buy it. But what's the reality in this case? Here. This is the developer. This is what actually happened. The developer went bankrupt. So you can take these photographs, and you can read them, and they say more. You can work your way through this, and there's symbolism in here, but just with things that I found. So I'm using the power of still photography, and I'm purposefully excluding people, and I'm basically just photographing places and objects and trying to weave together a body of work that serves as witness, inspired by the work that was made in the Great Depression, to the economic crisis of our time. Go through here. What's going on here? One photo that happens to have people, although we're far removed from the people. What are we looking at here? Does anybody have an idea? She's not sure. Anybody have a guess? Land auction. Not a land auction, but an auction. What kind of auction? If it's not a land auction, maybe that's right. So here we have multiple things that we can read in this photograph. One, look at the Civic Center. Look at where they are. This is downtown Stockton. What can we tell by that? We can tell, one, they had sort of a grand history. This isn't a place that, that, that doesn't have wonderful institutions, a wonderful history. This is a town that was an all-American city two times over. 2007, they're an all-American city. This is 2009. Imagine your town being an all-American city, having this grand history, having this wonderful, you know, wonderful civic center, and then becoming the epicenter of the foreclosure crisis, and then auctioning off your homes to the highest bidder. That's what's going on here. And that's, if you take a close look at it, I invite you when we're done to come up here. You can see the auctioneer in his tuxedo. You can see the people here. The little white tables are over there. That's where you try to close the deal if you make the, the winning bid for a home. And so as, we j as you just take a moment to take these in, I hope you'll move across it from the, the idea of mortgages and banks, but then the closing of the bank and the looming clouds to the auction, and then weaving together these homes. And in a few cases, I, wanna in I wanted to intersperse some references to the fact that it also affected business. It didn't need to just all be homes, so moved on to developments and in this case, uh, an office in a, in a closed-down business. But take it. Yeah, she said that this reminds her of cottage industry and businesses and home. For me, what this photograph, I, I call this photograph plant on the job. And it, it, because it is, it's an office plant, but it's an office plant, a living thing that was left behind when the office closed down, just forgotten and left there. And so when I was able to gain access through a, a commercial real estate agent to photograph in here. Um, you found this thing, and so I'm just using this, this dead plant as a symbolism, as a way of drawing you in so that you have some idea, some sense of that time and that place and that city. And if you were to take the whole body of work together, there's 41 images, then you, you'll get an even bigger picture. And each one hopefully speaks to another little incident, another little place, another little effect of the recession on this town of Stockton. And indeed, the town, this was 2009, the town in 2012 became preceding Detroit, the largest city in U.S. history to declare bankruptcy. So indeed, the concentric circles of this economic collapse have continued and they're still continuing to this day. This town is still struggling. They're still in bankruptcy. So in 2012, I returned to the city 
and I started photographing in this body of work really um, focuses on the people. And there are a lot of portraits, and there's portraits of people from the mayor who had to vote to go into bankruptcy to just people trying to live their lives in Stockton. And, and over the course of all of these years, if you take this whole body of work, you get a picture of Stockton, California that helps us remember, reflect, witness, and hopefully in the long run, have some healing around the fact that we went through this and let's do our very best to not go there again. And let's um, have some connection and have someone serve as witness to the struggle that Stockton, California went through in this, what is the largest economic collapse in our lifetime. Yeah, I'm just going to open up the floor. If you have any questions about any of the pieces or anything that I've done in this process, I'm here for you. I'll also let you know that I have, if you want a little memento, I brought some cards, and you're welcome to take one with you. It has a few of the photographs from the series. It has my contact information. You're welcome to uh, contact me anytime you want, and I will be available to you. Does anybody have a question? Sure. I just have the mic around, too. I was curious, you know, you're talking about a recession and a very negative time in our current history, yet compositionally, they're very beautiful. So it's, I think it's interesting that you're trying to have us reflect on this bad moment in our lives, but they're beautiful. So, so what is that juxtaposition? I'd be happy to speak to that. So we are inundated with images today. You know, we see images there everywhere all the time. And so if I'm going to make a photograph of something that's hard, that's a struggle that our country went through, but I want you to stop at least for a second or more and take a look at it. So to include that beauty, to take a photograph that has some beauty in it, but then there's a little something off, my hope is that you'll pause. My hope is that you'll stop. And there's, uh, there's a purposeful edit that way, an edit to a certain amount of images that have that quantity, that, in, that quality, that in intersection of beauty with tragedy. So here, uh, we were talking about this image. Yeah, the flowers are beautiful, but then you lay on top of it the, the knowledge. You can dig deeper, and you can know more. So it's, it's on purpose to try to make something that has some beauty in it on one level, but on another level, there's more. So if you want to dig in, you can find out, oh, that's a foreclosed home. Yes. the good and evil, the beautiful and the tragic, the horrific, along with beauty, you know, magnificence, and then degradation, side by side. You've captured it real well. Beautiful, um, but it's also, ha it comes with trouble. And so she's saying that this, uh, I think, uh, reflects uh, our experience of living life on this planet as a human. The, the both sides, the beauty and the struggle. Is that correct? Yeah. Thank you. I appreciate that. Another question? You're welcome. Sarah has another question. I just, I'm just fascinated by this work, and particularly um, with my own interest in photography, and I, d I think we've got another photographer here. It's your camera. Uh, how did you put your sequence together? Like, how do you know which images to put in a sequence that you know that this is a story you want to tell? Okay, so the, uh, the body of work was made over a long period of time, you know, weeks and months and, and a, a year, 2009, for this. And then if you throw in the work around the bankruptcy, you have four, six years put together. And so how do you sequence? Well, every time I shoot, I go and I pull the, in this case, I'm working with a digital camera. I don't always work with a digital camera. I use 
film, different formats, 4x5, 8x10. In this case, I'm using a digital camera because I knew I was going to be working for a long period of time, and it gives me the ability I need to shoot the quantity of photographs that I want to over this long period of time. But that means that you end up, end up with tens of thousands of photos, literally tens of thousands of photos over a long period of time. How do you edit? Well, my process is to edit each shoot each time when I return. So for example, when I got back from the first shoot, I took the couple of hundred shots that I made on that first shoot and I edited through and I picked my favorite and I set them aside, my favorites. Maybe there's 20 that I pulled out. And then when I get back from visiting the foreclosed homes, you know, I, maybe I went to uh, a foreclosed home and a bankrupt um, development on the same day. You know, you take the 400 photos and you go through and you pick what you feel are the strongest and you set them aside. And then the next time when you go back and you have the dramatic clouds that happen that day and you have the giant tumbleweed that can kind of symbolize this sort of loss and this sort of um, juxtaposition of development with nature, um, I edit and I take the 100 or the 200. And then, you know, you pull it together at the end. You take the, the ones that you pulled out from each shoot over that time and you're constantly editing, editing, editing until... Um, uh, it comes down to the end and you're taking the best of the best and you're editing and printing and it's a long, long process. And in the end, you take the tens of thousands of photos, the edits that you've done, and this body of work is now uh, complete and it's 41 images. And you contrast them together so that you have a good variety, so that you have the banks, the developments, a little bit of business, the homes, of course, are really the central subject, the, the best shot of the auction, and each thing taken together weaves together a cohesive body of work that looks at, in this case, the housing crisis, the foreclosure crisis that be turned into uh, the Great Recession. Oh, wow, lots of questions here. Let's go right here. So uh, I, would I actually have two small questions. One, looking at looking at the body of work, it seems like, or can you speak to in, you know, the intentions and the use of like very different focal lengths? For example, the foreclosed or the closed bank in the upper corner looks to be shot with fairly telephoto lens versus the clo the bankrupt land development seems very wide angle to ex you know, create that expansive depth. And the other question is, can you, you know, just kind of short description of your printing methods? Sure. So he, he asked about focal length, basically the lenses that I'm using when I'm shooting this and the choices around that. And then he would like to know a little bit of how did I print these. Uh, so uh, the focal length. Uh, in, in this case, um, I needed um, a telephoto lens or a long lens because um, I want, I'm making, in a sense, really formal portraits. And by formal, I mean they're, they're very symmetrical, they're, they're very um, centered, they're very balanced. Um, but in this case, in order to get this shot, I had to get up above because to shoot it from the street and look up at it is not a very attractive view of it. You'd have the distortion. So I had to find my way up, and luckily there was a parking garage across th the way that I was able to go up to the top floor of, and it was just the necessity of, of isolating the bank and not wanting the distortion of looking up at it. So that's why, in this case, there's a telephoto lens. Here, you asked about the development. I wanted to uh, show that it went on and on, that it was supposed to be uh, houses. This is supposed to be a front yard right here. Every one of these coils is supposed to be what connects the house that's supposed to be there to the electric grid. If you look through here, you'll see there's coils all through because it's supposed to be a neighborhood. Of course, the central uh, subject is the fact that they had already put up the uh, street sign. They've already named the streets. It's Flagstone and Black Ridge Drive. And then I was just um, blessed that day with dramatic clouds because the clouds help to set the mood. And so to have that wide angle lens in this case shows the whole of the bankrupt development and also helps me include these very dramatic clouds. So in each case I'm um, wrestling with the light. I'm wrestling with my access, how close I can get to it. And then I'm um, composing, but, but you know, there's, there's hundreds of photos of this when I got in here, and indeed I'm editing to the one that I feel like kind of sums it all up. And then about the printing. So these photos are made digitally. 
and they're printed on a large format. Um, it's basically, it's an inkjet printer, we call them in the art world, archival pigment prints. What that means is they're archival, they're made with inks, and on paper they're supposed to last for hundreds of years. And they're printed on a, a printer that is 24 inch, that at its widest is 24 inches. And so when I, this is the 24 inches, so, and the paper comes off of a roll, and it's this wonderful paper um, that uh, has a little bit of texture. It has a, a, like an old barata uh, coating to it. It has a little texture to it. And I'm able to print this size because the 24 inches allows me to then print along the roll. And so it's just, and it's also, of course, a process of taking the file, doing your post-production on it to optimize it, printing it, seeing how it prints, and then going back to the file and working on it to try to optimize just like we did and do in the dark room. You go in, you lay your paper under the enlarger, and you print it. And then you change your filter, and then you burn, and then you dodge. It's the same process that you use, but in a digital world. Did that answer your questions? Allie, did you have a question? Allie was part of the curatorial team, so I'm glad she's asking a question. Okay, so the problem with the news today is that we hear things when they first happen, so we don't really know the state of Stockton these days. So I didn't know if you could kind of give an update, because I know you're still ingrained in what's going on there. Am I not close enough? Hello. Oh, I wasn't done yet. Can you take my mic away? And then the other thing is, how do you envision, since you've kind of seen this from beginning to now, how do you envision kind of an end to this project, or how, how does it keep going? in any way. So the very first contact I had with your museum, and, and honestly the very first time I heard of Crystal Bridges was when the email popped into my inbox from Allie saying, the president of our museum and the curator are in your area and we'd like to come to your studio for a studio visit. Allie, Crystal Bridges. <laughs> What? <laughs> I mean, you, you, yeah, you don't you don't get emails like that every day, and you're wondering what is this? And yeah, immediately, of course, you're like, Crystal, oh, it's this amazing institution that's opened up in uh, Arkansas, and the but still, they're not they're not letting you know a lot about what's going on at this point. They're just like the president's here, the curator's here. Can we come by? All right. So Allie was my first connection with your institution, and she wants to know about this project, and so. Uh, and where it's at and where the city's at and uh, if and whether it's complete or not. Is it still going? So Stockton was just uh, a couple of weeks ago granted permission by the judge, his name's Judge Klein, to exit bankruptcy with a plan that they put forward. And so the before the end of the year, I expect you'll see on the news cycle, Stockton, California, formerly the largest city in U.S. history to declare bankruptcy, is now exiting bankruptcy. And so I've been working there, returned there, when they uh, were talking about uh, declaring bankruptcy, and I've been working 2012, 2013, 2014, and I've been making photographs, I've been making portraits of people who live in Stockton, some of the key players, like the mayor, like the city manager. Um, I've been also collecting artifacts that I find a lot along the way that have some kind of symbolism that contribute to the mood, and, uh, and then also making these sort of place and object photographs. And I have just completed the work. In fact, the week before I came here, I uh, my process to completing work is to release a newsletter to the newsletter list, and I send it out. And if you go on my uh, website, you can look at not only the complete body of work here uh, that your museum uh, purchased for this show with 41 images, you can also go to a gallery called Bank Rupture. In Bank Rupture, you'll find uh, an interweaving of these uh, photographs and artifacts that I was just talking about. You'll find portraits. You'll find place and object photos. You'll find artifacts that I've laid and scanned and collected. And my vision, now that the body of work is complete, now that the bankruptcy is over, is to some time, some place in the right gallery, the right institution, I'm going to put together a body of work and then hopefully a book that will bring all of this Stockton work together where you'll have 
this work, these place and object photos from the housing crisis, interspersed with the work that I made during the bankruptcy. And so you'll have really the whole picture. You'll have the place that where it began, you'll have the, some of the key players, you'll have some of the people who live there. And indeed, when I have the opportunity to have a grand exhibition, you'll walk in and you'll see objects that I found along the way. For example, there's playing cards that have little love notes that are written with them that I found discarded, but then they sort of speak to that time and that place and that sense of loss in the city. And you'll have a, a BB gun that I found uh, in an open field that I collected, but I also photographed where I found it. You'll have these wooden icicles that were on a, an old building in a, in a closed down Christmas tree farm. And you'll walk in and you'll have the icicles and then you'll have a photograph of this abandoned Christmas tree farm. And then you'll walk and you'll have this BB gun that's been aged out in the sun because it was discarded in Stockton and it sort of symbolizes loss of innocence but also a little bit of the violence. And then you'll have a grand portrait of the mayor who's stressed out and there's a large extermination trap that's next to her where she's sitting where she, the portrait was made. And then you can, you can research, you can find out, well, Stockton City Hall has a problem with rodents. And indeed, Stockton tried to buy another building to move their city government into that building, but then that building was foreclosed on and they're still stuck in the same city hall that still has these rodent problems. And just that little extermination trap in, with this portrait of the mayor, which wasn't put there, but was just there and so ubiquitous that it wasn't even thought about to remove it. It's just there, it's part of the scene. And you take all of these things together, all of these objects and then portraits and then these, um, close down homes and businesses, and it'll be like you're immersing yourself in Stockton during that time, and you'll be able to walk through and really get a sense of the place and the time and the people, and hopefully my hope and my desire in all of this is that, I've said it before, that you'll be able to witness it the way that I did. You'll be able to reflect on it and think about it, and hopefully in serving as witness, it'll also, the way the migrant mother does, helps us sort of heal a little bit because there we are oh yeah I oh yeah I've heard about the depression now here's a woman who's actually going through it now we're experiencing we're connecting with that and whenever we connect and whenever we bring that sort of sense of witness there's something that happens where we can start to heal and start to move on and even though I'm looking at something that's hard that's a struggle that really underlie underlies my desire one thing that that happened this morning was uh, the educational programs I don't know if you know but you're Museum here, Crystal Bridges Museum, is such a fantastic institution. They have an educational program where they bring students through, students through every day. Hundreds and thousands of students are coming through this institution, and I'm lucky enough to have this exhibit as part of where they stop. And so I was invited by Zev, a gentleman who I met at the opening, to come, because he heard I was going to be here today, to come early this morning and just stand in the background and watch what's happening. Indeed, I'm standing back there, and this group of kids come in, comes in, and they set them down, and they're asking them questions. They're like, well, what do you see? And the, the kids are like, oh, I don't know. I see uh, houses. I see uh, Dam I see damage, I see, and then slowly but surely the folks who are facilitating these talks are, are getting them to sort of pick out what's, what's going on here. And you can see their minds thinking and they're starting to realize and exactly what I hoped would happen. They're starting to witness and see and experience a little bit, just a taste of it for a second of what other people's struggles are. And then they would bring them over here and they'd say, Oh, well, here's the title. It's the Great Recession, Foreclosure USA. And then all of a sudden, oh, I've heard of foreclosure. Foreclosure is when people's homes are taken away. When the bank, oh, the bank, oh, and just exactly that. And, it was, and I'm so grateful for that gift that was given to me by the museum, by the folks who run the educational program, so that I could stand back there and just quietly witness children experiencing the work and working their way through it, just picking out things, and then with a little bit of knowledge, just like I'm talking about, a little bit of knowledge, we can start to read the photos, just giving them the title, The Great Recession, Foreclosure USA, they start to really click and understood. And it was a, a great gift that was provided to me through the museum and through that experience. 